Amen. Just a beautiful moment with our men and uh, with Bob and the service together of the Lord and our deacons. We are blessed with five men who love the Lord, who love their wives. Uh, Doug, not married, but loves you. Loves uh, all these deacons. Love you as the church family. Okay. And uh, next month, I'm going to do be doing teaching a class for all the men of the church who might be interested in exploring what it is to be a deacon. Uh, so we have material, we have a book together that we'll work together with. So you'll, you'll get more information on that. God may have uh, been serving as a deacon for you. He may not. It's not basically a, a hierarchy or the best of all positions. It has to do with the call. It has to do with actually serving. But all of you as men can serve the Lord powerfully and, and in a way that matters in our church family. So next month, be looking for that announcement if that's something that's kind of stirring on your heart. It's not a popularity contest in any way, shape, or form. It's about serving the Lord, and Bob has served the Lord uh, profoundly and served him well. I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is a, a letter of the Apostle Paul to the church that's in Corinth. We've talked about the city and what kind of metropolis it was. And uh, what it was like and how through the Apostle Paul, God birthed uh, a Christian church, early Christian church, somewhere in the 40s or 50s uh, uh, of, of A.D. 40, 50, 60 uh, uh, in there to actually be a Christian church in the middle of what was a city very similar in many ways to Vegas. Uh, it was entertainment, it was archi- it was culture, it was museums, it was productions, it was athletics, it was the whole scene. It was commerce, it was making a lot of money, it was moving from low status to high status. You could be somebody in that city even if you were nothing, okay? And it's a church that just kind of came out of that whole scene, all right? So 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is a, a great book on just him beginning to speak into the life of this church because we're going to find out in a moment he got a report from Chloe, a lady named Chloe, who was probably a businesswoman who made who commerced between Corinth and Ephesus, another great city. And he got a report about what was going on in the Corinthian church, uh, the believers in the church of Corinth. And it wasn't good. Okay, it wasn't good. And so I want to read go through the passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Follow along with me. I'll put it on screen where you can, I'll read it out loud and you follow along. He says this, Now I urge you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree in what you say, that there be no divisions or schisms, the idea of being pulled apart, that there be no divisions among you, and that you be united with the same understanding and the same conviction. Those are two words, understanding and conviction, that can mean a variety of things. But basically, you ought to have the same attitude and you ought to have the same mindset. Those are current ways of saying things. You ought to have the same attitude about each other. You ought to have the same mindset together. But instead, there is schism. So he's saying there shouldn't be things that divide your head. That's what basically the schism can, is, is means, is division. So instead of there being divisions, there should be uniting. You ought to have the same mindset. You ought to have the same attitude. You ought to have the same way, point of view on the things that do matter. Verse 11, for it has been reported to me about you, my brothers, my, by members of Chloe's household, that there is a rivalry among you. Ah, in church? Ah, how can that be? How could there be competition? This is basically competing, conflicting, competing actions. That's what the word is in rivalry. There is rivalry around you. You've got Penn State, you've got Ohio State, okay? There's a rivalry going on. That's, that's great TV, it's great productions, it's great ratings because you love to see these rivalry teams play. Rivalries are way more interesting than just simply a standard two teams playing together. Rivalries draw a crowd, not supposed to be in the body of Christ. So he says, Chloe brings a report that there are rivalries among you. Verse 12, what I'm saying is this. Each of you says, quote, I'm with Paul, end quote, or, quote, I'm with Apollos, 
end quote, or I'm with Cephas, end quote, or I'm with Christ. Then he asked them some questions, rhetorical but meaningful. Is Christ divided? The better translation is dismembered. I'm sorry, did Christ get pulled apart? One of you have a leg, one of you have an eyeball, one of you have an ear. Did Christ get pulled apart? Did the body of Christ get somehow vivisected, dissected in some way, separated? How is this? He's asking this question. I'm sorry, is Christ divided? Was it Paul who was crucified for you? Did I miss something? Who was on the cross? Wait a minute. There's a lot of history here. Did we miss something? Paul was on the cross and not Jesus? Were you baptized in Paul's name? Paul says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one of you who were baptized in my name, indeed, I did in fact baptize the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know if I baptized anyone else. I don't remember, but I hope I did not baptize too many people is what he's saying, because you would have made an issue of it. Verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to evangelize, not with clever words, and here's the bottom line result, so that the cross of Christ will not be emptied of its effect. Disunity impacts the impact of the gospel. Disunity impacts the impact of of the gospel. We thought it was just not getting along. We thought it was just simply two points of view that just couldn't get it reconciled. We thought basically somehow it's just a personality clash that resulted in the schism. Fine, it impacts the overall presentation of our particular fellowship in the presentation of the gospel. And I might even suggest to you, and I'm here in the crowd as well, and basically I know what's going on in the the church of Jesus Christ for the most part in our area and beyond. There, there's lots of churches like us. 46% of the churches of Southern Baptists didn't baptize one person last year. Now, let me tell you how many churches there are in the Southern Baptist Convention. 40,000. 40,000 churches and 40%, 6% didn't baptize anybody. Then I go back to the original question I asked you last week. How do we as Baptists plant most of our churches? Division. We're going to find out in a moment, division contaminates that movement. It sterilizes that movement. It feels good in the moment because you're righteous and you're right and you're starting something new and you get to go and you get to do something new and start all over again without somebody telling you what you can and can't do anymore. It feels good, but you moved with sterility. You moved with sterility. You moved unable to reproduce over time. This is... An amazing passage. It's been here for a long time, and I'm just looking at it with new eyes. He's saying, your unity matters. Verse 10, I urge you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus, all that he is, all that he claims to be, all that he is, his power, his majesty, I, 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 actually, I admonish you, I urge you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all would agree. Why? Agree in what you say so there's no divisions among you, so you can be united with the same understanding, the same conviction, so you can say the same thing. It's one of those things that's part of our history as the church of Jesus Christ, because when you're part of a split, you're part of a division, you ultimately are saying to individuals, Jesus Christ has the power to defeat everything in your life, except for church schisms. It's like someone say it, in some ways can say it, and I understand. Everybody goes through this, but you can say, I'm going to stand up and teach a seminar on marriage, uh, but I've been divorced. God can help you 
in your current marriage, obviously, we pray God's blessing on that. But for you to stand and say, God will help you endure everything. He will help you in every trial. He will help you in every difficulty. He will help you to love when no one loves you back. He will help you to forgive. So what happened in the first marriage? Jesus not around? Took a vacation? You understand? I'm not saying you shouldn't say all those things. Just understand. Let's just be a bit authentic. Something about us didn't let him be him in that setting. I got up this morning to do something that I have not done in probably, I don't know. Oh, goodness, I don't know. How long has it been since we lived in Virginia? Maybe 20 years I came out of my house, went out to the car, and I got inside. I could not see out. And I turned the car on, and the car fires up, thankfully, and there's 32 degrees. And I'm sitting on the hardest leather seats I have ever sat on. For whatever reason, I turned to look to the right And my back window has been open all night. That's why I couldn't see anything inside or out. And I'm sitting there in the the seat saying, who's responsible for this? Oh, this weather. Oh, my goodness. This cold. No, who's responsible for me sitting on cold leather, 32 degrees, watching the windshield just take it off one millisecond at a time, millilength, millimeter, whatever. And I got the back one doing the same thing. I'm just sitting there freezing just like I got to wait to this whole thing. I don't have a scraper. I don't have a scraper anywhere. I I got nothing. I sat there for 15 minutes. I was ahead of the game when I got out there. I wanted to get here early. And now I'm sitting there just watching the windshield go back and forth and just shave off by millimeters this ice that is completely encasing my vehicle. And who is to blame? Right here. It is a revolutionary moment in our lives, an honest-to-goodness, liberating moment When you and I begin to look at the circumstances of our life and the conditions of our life and the failures of our life and the divisions of our life and we'll say, I'm to blame. It's a liberating moment because now you kind of know where the problem is. Instead of blaming everybody else and blaming every other thing, every other person, y'all, you can just kind of finally say, it starts with me. It starts with me. And it has impacts. What I'm saying is sometimes there's two things that happen. One, we can get real with ourselves that, yeah, we're part to blame for some of the difficulties and challenges and and hurts that are in our life. But there's consequences that we keep viewing and we wonder where those come from. Where do those consequences come from? Why does this happen in my life? Why do I find relationships very, very difficult? Why is that ongoing? Why is that ongoing? And you never actually look and say, you know, Let me start with myself because being who I've been has consequences. And Corinthians here, Paul's going to say, you just being yourselves is actually gutting the gospel. It's making it empty. It's making it unfruitful, unpowerful, unproductive. You're the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Jesus Christ, but your division is causing the gospel to simply be declared like it's a shell and like there's really life in it. Oh, but why the world? Nothing's happening. God vacated the core. It's empty. So what is the division that was going on here? This is crazy. Look at what he says here. This is kind of hard to understand at first. You're like, he says, well, here's what I'm saying, verse 12. Each of you, he seems to say each of you have got a favorite team in this church. Here's what it is. I'm with Paul. So you had the Paul team. I'm with Apollos. 
Paul was the founder of this church. Paul was the missionary who showed up and endured some of the kickback and some of the difficulty and all, the, all that went on to actually get this church in formation. He's the one who left his comfortable home back in Jerusalem, back in, uh, back in Judea. He's the one who traded everything that he was as a religious elite person. He threw it all away and said, I'm just going to tell people about the resurrected Jesus. He's the one who traveled thousands of miles to show up in Corinth in this metropolitan city and help them understand the difference between ultimately everything that this world offers and what Jesus actually declares. And there were some individuals there saying, hey, we're, uh, we're some of the original people here. We're some of the originals who were saved under the ministry of the Apostle Paul. We, we've been in this church longer than anybody else. We're, we're with Paul. Well, Paul later sent somebody named Apollos to actually... Uh, uh, fill in at times to actually continue to provide encouragement and instruction for this Corinthian church when he wasn't there. And Apollos was a great speaker. Apollos was like an apologetic person. He was very, very powerful. He was Greek. He knew how to, to use the logic and he knew how to use the scriptures. And it said in the book of Acts, he was powerful because he could refute the Jews. He could defeat their arguments completely and he could ultimately, uh, uh, to, you know, help them understand where they were wrong about Jesus. So he was smart. He was eloquent. And the group of the church said, hey, this guy is smart. He is eloquent. You know, I like that. I like hanging with people who are smart and who are eloquent. I like people who can put people in their place. I like that. I like the zingers. I like being able to say in like three sentences what other people take like three years to say. And, and, then, and then the person you say it to is like fried. Oh. You go, I love that. I love just knowing you got that kind of power. You're snarky. I'm not saying he was snarky, but anyway, Apollos, Team Apollos was intelligent. Team Apollos was wise. Now we have Team Cephas. Who is Team Cephas? Cephas is the Hebrew name for Peter. This is individuals who say, um, we are deeply Jewish. Peter, uh, of all the things that Peter did and did not do, he was Jewish. His ethnicity matters. I'm Jewish. I connect with Peter. I connect with his fishermen. Maybe I even connect with his sense of, mm, I don't know, hard-working, uh, calloused hands, fisherman side of it. But he was a Jewish fisherman. I, I connect with Peter. He's, he's kind of like, um, you know, he's, he's the guy who, just, who stood up and he power. He's courageous. Yeah, he's a little crazy. <laughs> he's a little out there. He puts his foot in his mouth more times, but he's not afraid. He's out there. I like being Peter. He's, he's bold. He's bold. Yeah, he's a little uncouth. He's a little rough on the edges, but I'm rough on the edges too, you know. I like Peter. He's kind of rough on the edges. And then the last one said, um, I'm with Christ. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm with Christ I understand you're following this. I'm with Christ. Well, what do you mean you're with Christ? Christ kept the law. Jesus kept the law. He said, I, don't I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. Jesus was, in fact, a true Jew, and he was a law keeper. He kept the law in every way, perfectly. And shouldn't we keep the law perfectly if Jesus kept the law perfectly? <sighs> You uncouth, in some ways, out there, crazy Cephas. Apollos, you think you're so smart? Well, keeping the law is really what is smart. And Paul, uh, Paul, Paul, we're not sure he's fully a friend of the law. He basically says that the law has been fulfilled and that there's a new basis for a relationship with God through Jesus Christ apart from the law. Hmm. So you got these four teams. Paul says you, you've divided yourself into four teams. Why, how did this church get four teams in the church? Division necessitates teams. When there is division in the church, 
undeniably, someone's got to rise up as the leader, as the one who represents that division most clearly, most powerful. It's a group. We call them cliques. But over here, there's an individual, group of individuals who feel a certain way, and they don't really say, let's take a vote who's going to be the spokesman. They simply just identify someone's a little bit more passionate than the others about that particular point of view. They become the spokesman. Here, here, here's what the Scripture's saying, what he's trying to say powerfully. When a schism takes place, when there's division in the church, all of a sudden, the church begins following someone else other than Christ. Because now it's not just going to church to follow Jesus and to obey him and actually follow him in the scriptures. Now you got to check and make sure she's okay with what you're doing or he's okay with what you're doing. Now you have to act in reference to someone else in the division. Because you've got to be sure who's, who's on what team. You're like, no, I thought this was a new thing. I thought division in the church was a new thing. This is the Corinthian church. It's not even 30 years after Jesus is resurrected. The seed for division is in us. It's built in us. It was built in the Corinthians because in the city of Corinth, status is everything. Everything. And so if you were going to be a patron and you were going to have status, remember I talked about this whole system? You had to get people around you who loved you, who believed what you believed, and would say ultimately things about you that would allow you as a spokesman to actually continue to elevate in the culture. They simply brought the Corinthian culture into the church. It made sense to them. We've got four patrons here. We've got Paul, we've got Apollos, we've got Cephas, and we've got Christ. Now, which one do you think is going to get you where you want to go in your Christian walk? That's why Paul says in verse 13, I'm sorry, did Jesus get dismembered? Did, uh, in a particular ceremony, was uh, was there an operating table here on the stage? And Jesus came up on the stage and he laid down and someone brought out all the the covering and the Q45 masks or whatever they are and they had live saws and they fired up the saws and began to cut Jesus's knee off at the leg off at the knee and, and they came over and they got his ear that's what he's saying I'm sorry is he divided what basis what right what arrogance do you and I feel when you feel like Jesus Christ could be separated in any way? No, I was on the side. I was watching it. I don't like it. Um, It's not pretty to watch, and I don't like the sight of blood. I don't like the sound of loud saws, and I don't like the sound of crunching bone being sawed, and I don't like that whole image of my mind, but I, I couldn't do anything. Whether you were part of the division or whether you were a watcher, Jesus Christ got pulled apart. It's the, it's the body of Christ. You say, I don't think it's that vivid. Oh, 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 you don't? Because the consequence is, is that the gospel becomes empty because of it. You don't think it's a big deal? You don't think every church has got to wake up and realize division is absolutely lethal to the gospel. Whether I cause it, whether you cause it, whether we cause it together, it destroys our witness and it guts the power of the gospel. Which is why we haven't baptized in two years. Right? Could be. See, I'm not just, I'm not about us. I've been in the church all my life. I grew up. I'm a pastor's kid. We transitioned almost all, uh, two of the three transitions with my dad was over a vote that I woke up the next morning and found out we were moving. I, I get it. It's not unique to us. It's 
not unique to Baptists. Assemblies of God get to do it too. Methodists get to do it. They plan on doing it every three years. So if you can last three years, you get to go to a new site. That's kind of a good deal. Baptists should have looked into that a long time ago. Amen. Let's see, he's been here four years. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, Absolutely. Is Christ divided? Was it Paul who was crucified for you? Paul, what kind of question is that? (laughs) Was Paul... Was Paul crucified for you? He's using audacity here. Are you kidding me? You actually use my name. Paul doesn't go after these guys as though they're kind of like false teaching. He's just dealing with the fact, are you kidding? You even use my own name. You're using me as an issue of dividing the body of Christ. You're using my name as a basis for splitting the body of Christ here in Corinth. Did Paul die for you? There should only be one click in church, and that's the click for Jesus Christ. That's about him. But we all have to choose that. Because we all understand, we all want status, and if we can't get it personally, we want to hang out with a person who does have it. And I'm sorry if you're a Packers fan today, you're grieving, okay? I know some of you don't watch NFL, but I do still. I know Ethel, I know you're watching perhaps right now, and you're grieving, and I pray for you, and and I mourn for you, okay? But very, very early, we all just kind of understand it, kids, that you need to have somebody in your corner that helps you augment your smallness and your weakness. And one of the best ways to do that is to get a favorite football team. And man, every time that team wins, you are big. They lose, mm, you're down on the belly, slithering around. But when they win, it's the top of the moment. And one of the churches I was there as a kid, me and my twin brother, and my dad was pastoring the deacons, had a best friend who was a deacon's kid. And Harold loved the Dallas Cowboys, and I loved the Los Angeles Rams at the time. Super Bowl, I mean, uh, NFC playoff, amazing, okay? But we knew whatever happened on Sunday afternoon, there was going to be a fight between he and I on Monday. It wasn't in science. It was just simply, he's going to say, so he's going to come over and he's going to poke me and say, did your team really show up? Or for those the cheerleaders, some corny, ancient statement, really? And I'm going to say, because you said that, I'm going to punch you bad, okay? That was very offensive to me, okay? You hurt my feelings because you touched the team that was part of my winning status, So if your team doesn't win, you're on the belly. If the person that you actually ascribe virtue or power or status who you've been following, you find out that they have clay feet, that movie star that you're like, I love every movie. I'm just sorry he committed suicide. I really love that band. Man, I totally get into them, but the lead singer just overdosed. That was part of my life. I love this politician, but they lost the race. I don't feel so good. Why? Because whether intentionally or unintentionally, we are ascribing our identity to individuals of status. We've got to have somebody up there, further up the ladder, who's representing us. This here, I'm not saying this is what's happening, but I think Paul's confrontation, he's rebuking the whole idea that anybody else in the Christian life can give you a leg up on Jesus. He's speaking against the whole idea of the saints and the worship of the saints, and that in fact this saint is going to get you closer to God, that if you talk to this saint, he's got an end. Or you talk to Mary, you talk to somebody who actually has status. Don't go to Jesus. He's like way up there. I choose to come down the ladder a bit because I can't go all the way to Jesus. I'm not really that good. But ah, Peter, the rough fisherman, eh, I'm kind of okay there. I'm rough around the edges and he's rough around the edges. He's going to be my advocate. I'm going to borrow his status. You're like, Jonathan, you're seeing way more of this passage than I see. Okay. 
Now, the reason I'm going off on this together with you and with me, because Paul's going off, is Christ divided? Was it Paul who was crucified for you? Oh, by the way, were you baptized in Paul's name? Then he remembers, man, I thank God I baptized none of you. Uh, except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say they were baptized in my name. He's like, even you are going to take, you're going to actually put somebody on a pedestal because they baptized you. And we say this to each other, who baptized you? I was baptized by this pastor. I was baptized by that pastor. Whoa, 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 whoa. You got some of the serious water. (laughs) <laughs> you, wow, I, I got baptized in a creek. Oh, really? A creek? Mm, no, I was baptized in the church. Wow, wow. It was treated Mary Esther water. Sorry, whoa. We had a baptismal pool in, um, in where I was, my first church church had been there for a very, very long. It was the oldest Baptist church in Orange County. Uh, there was algae on the outside of the, t- in the inside of the tank. Hey, you want to follow Jesus or not? Okay. You want to follow him? You get in the tank, whatever's in there. They didn't clean it out. Be a dead spider just kind of floating along. Are you serious about following Christ? We leave bugs in the baptistry. Okay. I'm laughing at us. Right? This is satire for us because we drop names. We say who married us, who buried us. We haven't been buried yet. Who who actually baptized us? Who who we set under his ministry? We set under their ministry. We were there with this or with that. Why do we do that? Status. Conscious or unconscious enough, we're just telling each other, I'm spiritually something more. I'm going to this conference to hear her. And I've been to conference where you're going to hear him. And you go and a, a conference with a guy who's written 30 books, and he stands up and he says, let me tell you the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died, was buried, and he was raised three days. And the place goes nuts. <laughs> So I come home from Promise Keepers, and I'm, like, I'm going to try that. Jesus was died, buried, and raised three days later. Yeah. I, I gave you a cue. I gave you a cue. That was with a cue, okay? I, I'm just saying, we come back, and little pastor nobody says the same thing, but pastor who's written 30 books says Jesus died, buried, rose again. He's like, from the, from the mouth of God. How did he get that way? We made him that way. It's a danger. All these Christian celebrities, one day they're going to stand before Jesus. I do not know their hearts. I do know human hearts. I do know my own heart. I know you get 30,000 people in a coliseum cheering you, listening to your every word. That feels good, I would think. And we say this, I'm from this, I'm from that. I believe in this school of thought. I believe in this theologian. I believe in this singer. I believe in this writer. And we drop these names as though we're like a a collection of status. I'm saying it isn't wrong for individuals to serve God well and do well. And we're in a, a setting that lets you write a book or two. I have to give mine away. All right? Okay? So don't try to use me as status. Okay? It'll get you nothing but a cup of coffee, maybe, at Dunkin' Donuts. I'm saying there's nothing wrong with excellence and individuals that are being raised to serve the body of Christ. But please understand, American free enterprise does not equate to the body of Christ. Jesus never wrote a book. Okay, now, I know I'm hitting us all below the belt here because we've all got heroes. Heroes within the body of Christ, they're like idols. 
why would you elevate someone to some sort of status that we would actually benefit from when Jesus Christ is the ruling, raised, and returning Lord of all? So who made you and me with the capacity to stand in the body of Christ in the setting and basically say, follow me? I'm sorry, did Jesus step off the stage? I'm sorry, did he get cut apart? Did you get apart now and you're, you're exclusive? I mean, you understand that's how Christian churches in many ways through the Middle Ages, they all claim to have a piece and part of Jesus. That's what made these big uh, cathedrals really matter. Somebody had a part of the cross. Somebody had the old thorns. Somebody had a part of the hem of his garment. Somebody had it in this sacred piece of Jesus, and that's what made it the cathedral. Here's where he is. I'm going to tie this up, okay? He says, I baptize none of you. Okay? I'm not about building my own name. He said, I did baptize Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know if I baptized anyone else. It's almost like it doesn't really matter whether I baptized any or else or whatever. The fact of the matter is the point was the person in the water was confessing their faith and trust and allegiance solely to Jesus Christ, not to the person who baptized them. And there are no grandparents with God. It's not like I'm in the water and if, hey, if Brother Jonathan's good with his truth, I'm good with it, go ahead. That's what happens when Jonathan falls badly and falls on his face and disqualifies himself from ministry and your faith goes kaput. Why? Because your faith was in me. You thought being baptized by me as a spiritual person got you some sort of status. No, absolutely not. And I was wrong to lead you that way, to believe that way, to ever understand that if you follow me, it's equated to following Jesus Christ. Only Paul could say that. So ministers, whether unpopular or popular, we have to be sure and clear of you. You follow Jesus Christ solely. Solely. And he says this for three reasons. Here's where we get to the bottom line. I'll tie this up. Verse 17. Christ did not send me to baptize, but to evangelize. He didn't send me to baptize, but to evangelize. Paul says, I want you to know, even the baptism side, he's separating the idea that you hear the message of the gospel. Jesus is the one who saves you. You're saved by the word, by the message, by the gospel. You become a believer. Paul says somebody else, for the most part, did the baptism, which is a step of obedience for the believers. But he's like, I'm the one who is to proclaim the gospel. That's what I was sent to do. The original commission from Jesus Christ who was risen was not to baptize. He's saying baptism is not a saving work. There is no such thing as being baptized, being saved, being baptized. Paul's saying being saved is being saved by trusting Jesus and believing the content and, and, and internalizing the content of the gospel. Being baptized is your first step of confession that, in fact, you identify with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection as your own. That's a personal statement that I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Paul says, I was sent to evangelize, not to baptize. Baptism, baptism is necessary. It's a necessary following, but that's not the key thing. That's On the hierarchy of things, it's the gospel that matters. But he says this. He did not send me to baptize, but to evangelize, not with clever words, so that the cross of Christ will not be emptied of its effect or made hollow. Had a company take down a tree just a couple of weeks ago. Didn't look terrible. I knew it was problematic because the woodpeckers loved it. Okay, and that was a big sign. And I would listen to them hit, hit, hit their head against it. And, and it would change tunes. As it went up to kind of different parts of the tree, it would be a different sound. I'm like, eh, something's not going on there. They took it down. They started bringing it down. They, they actually brought a truck there. They, they started to pop it and, and, or saw it off at the bottom. It fell into the street and exploded. It was so dead. Big old hole in the middle just like that. didn't look totally dead. It looked in trouble, but it was dead. 
and time where a storm was going to come by and blow on it, and it was going to end up on my house, and I didn't want that. So I suspected it was wrong, made a good call. He cut it, and he's like, yeah, you're actually late. This is, you're very fortunate you got out of here without falling in your house because it's empty. It's empty. What is it about cleverness of speech that is produced by divisions? In other words, everyone's got to argue their point. What is it about cleverness of speech to argue your point and your allegiance to a leader, a status, a person of status? What is it that causes the cross of Christ to be emptied of its effect or made hollow? The first thing is there cannot be in the declaration of the gospel any contamination of human status. The gospel will not tolerate, cannot tolerate, does not tolerate any sense that because a person of status preaches the gospel, it will be more effective. The gospel is going to be proclaimed by natives. It's going to be proclaimed by aristocrats. It's going to be proclaimed by Russian Christians. It's going to be proclaimed by Australian Christians. It's going to be proclaimed by men, by women, social economic levels. The gospel of Jesus Christ has nothing to do in its effectiveness with your personal human status. Now, that's good news for you who say, well, I just really don't know what I can do for Christ. I don't really have the position. I don't have status. I don't have a title. No, the gospel is a power in itself. You just share it. It has nothing to do with status. When the gospel has to do with status, then it is being hollowed out. I do not know how Southern Baptist evangelists function this way. I get letters from them all the time. They want to come and do a revival. And what they tell me is here, 46 people got saved here. 37 people got saved there. 102 got saved over here. 45 got saved. What? What? What's that supposed to do for me? If you bring me in, people are going to get saved. Now, what we're never going to do is say, let's go back to all the churches you've been. Let's just see where those believers are. Because frankly, an evangelist that can't get people saved isn't going to be working too much. He kind of knows that. If he doesn't actually speak for status and results, which is number three, I'm not there yet. If he doesn't speak for a, a predictability of results, we will not give him the pulpit. You must guarantee that you can produce souls. Because I'm not going to pay for you and put you in a hotel and give up a whole week of ministry. Have you stand up here and nobody get saved. Mm, not good for you. Not good for me. Paul says, listen, the gospel has nothing to do with the status of the person who preaches it. Cannot be any human effort. Secondly, There is no particular speech that you have to use to make the gospel clear to someone else. The gospel is what it is. You do not need to improve on it. I know we want to argue. I know we want to debate. I know we want to tell people they're wrong. I I know we want to zing them. I want to tell them why the Bible's true and why they're not. I know we want to ruffle them up. But all of that, for the most part, is about status. The gospel is simply Jesus Christ lived, he died, he was buried, he was raised three days later from the dead. He is alive. That's the gospel. You don't need to like go somewhere and try to figure out what the speech. I love Bible school. Austin's in Bible school right now. I've had way too much, okay? You can have a lot of that as though, man, now you can really put it together. And if you can, if you can have that doctorate, which I have, and two master's degrees, and an undergrad, that's going to let you put the gospel in such a way that whenever you speak it, boom, people are going to get saved. And I'm here to tell you, just knowing how to speak or to preach or to make an argument has nothing to add to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're like, wow, Paul must really believe the gospel was something else. 
Yeah, he says it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believed, to the Jew first and, and then to the Gentile. The gospel is the power. When you proclaim it, someone doesn't get saved. It's not on you. It's on the gospel. It's on them not receiving the gospel. It's a power in and of itself. So it's not about status. It's not about you having the exact words and have learned some sort of secret hyper wisdom speech to just make it like, wow, when you say it, everybody just believes it. And the last one has to do with results. There is no prediction of results. In division... In division, the best thing that can happen if you're in a divided church and you're part of one of these schisms over here, there is a, there's kind of a joy when someone joins you. Says, I'm with you. Um, it's almost like the same feeling you get when somebody gets saved. And you almost want to baptize them right there and say, yeah, welcome to the schism. You're a believer now in what I believe and, and how we're divided here. And we just want to baptize you and make you part of our little church. Now I'm just being an idiot, okay? I am preaching to offend you. You do understand that? I'm preaching to offend me because Jesus is offended by our disunity. And frankly, though I believe we are starting to begin to humble ourselves in our communication, in our treatment, in our interactions together as brothers and sisters in Christ, I am not so sure there are not consequences that we're going to live out for a period of time until he's sure we've got it. Because the gospel matters to God the Father about his son more than our survival, more than our thriving more than just simply functioning as a Christian church. No, the world expects more from us, though they really don't care, but it doesn't really matter. That's not the voice that really should matter. The Apostle Paul saying Jesus has not been dismembered. He is whole. He is fully capable. The Spirit can bring about the wholeness of the body of Christ together. But when you have factions of four different individuals who are using status to tear the body of Jesus apart, then when you actually come around and say, what's our mission is to share the gospel, you share that gospel, but it ends up you passing out cake with, with nothing in it. It's got frosting in it, but no, no insides. You end up giving candy that basically has been eaten from the inside out. It's, it's, it's not living. It's not consistent. There's no power in it. And that's where we, we have to say, Jesus... Spirit, if it's about me, then show me where I'm part of this. Show me if, if I sense that there's people in our church who are still just coming because I'm just the pastor here. Maybe there's a few who just say, uh, we're, we're, we kind of believe in what Jonathan's doing. Or maybe there's other members in the church who say, I still come because he's still here because I kind of like connect to him. Or she's still here and, and I just really believe it. I don't know, I just got to stay because she's still here. She's a spiritual person. Whatever keeps you here, whatever your reason is for being here, if it's other than Jesus Christ and coming to worship him and follow him and obey him and his word, it's an idol. I don't want to be on it, the throne, the pedestal. I'm off of it. Anybody else want to be off of that? Get off of it. And you know who you are. You know who we are. It's because people come to us, and if anybody comes to you and they begin talking about other members, th they want you to start a clique. They want you to start a new group. Do you agree with me about this? What are we going to call ourselves? It's not because there isn't fallenness in us. It's not because believers don't make mistakes. It's not because pastors can never be idiots and do things that are stupid. We can and we do. 
It's because you've been made a part of the body of Christ because of Jesus Christ who has changed you from the inside out. You keep your eyes on him at all times. And then you pray for one another. You love one another. You forgive one another. You exhort one another. These are all biblical admonitions that are for protecting and preserving and actually making unity happen. Not just uniformity like we're getting along. No, unity in Christ. That's what we're going for. And we want the cross of Christ, which is a metonymy for the idea of being the gospel. The cross of Christ is emptied of its effect. It's made hollow. What a sad thing to think. What a sad thing for Paul to say about this Corinthian church. And man, he says, you got it all. You got spiritual gifts. You got, you got all kinds of stuff going on in your church. Man, you lack nothing. God has ultimately blessed you in so many ways. And now you've, just, you've got yourself all divided into factions. And now the gospel of Jesus Christ that was initially very fruitful in you at one time, it's now hollow, it's meaningless, it's powerless, it's not productive because of your disunity. So where are we going to go from here? Well, we're going to go on to the next bunch of verses is where we're going. We've got a whole year of this. It's God's word. If you hear me say something or you look on the screen and you say, you know, he was just way off on that, please tell me. I'm good with that. I want not to make it up. That's Paul's point. Don't add to the gospel. The gospel has God's power inherent in it. Declare it. Live it. Model it. Trust it. Because it has the power to take people who are far away from God and bring them close to him. Take people who are hopeless and make them hopeful and give them hope. People who are just racked by their own sinful, destructive, self-destructive choices who can be just forgiven and made clean. The gospel has so much power to bring together people from all tribes and tongues and ultimately bring them together. And they may not even speak the same language, but in their spirit, they're united in Christ. You say, that sounds like heaven. Yeah, it does. It's something only God can do. I can't produce it. I can declare it, I can study it, I can define it, uh, but I'm going to go just like you and I'm going to say, God, Father, in Jesus' name and the power of the Spirit, you bring this about in my life personally, in my marriage, bring it about in my family, bring it about in the church family that I love to be a part of. May we not just be uniform, but may we be united. That's where we're going. Let's close in a prayer. Father, I thank you for our time together. As our team comes to lead us in a closing hymn, Father, I thank you for the unity of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. We call it the Trinity, the tri-unity. God, you live with this kind of unity of being equal together but distinguishable. It's a mystery. And so we're wondering really just how that works together where we're individuals but we all have our faith and trust in your son Jesus and spiritually we want to experience the kind of communion the kind of participation together that that simply helps us all helps us all to know when we're moving in a direction or an action or a speech that ultimately is bringing about division that would ultimately destroy what we have here and what you would have us to experience and, and actually neuter us. And, and when we share the gospel that you can be saved and you can be forgiven, that you choose not to bring about that transformation because it's coming out of a source that's contaminated. We want to be clean before you. We want to love you. We want to love each other. And I thank you for what I'm seeing in my own life. You're beginning to help me take baby steps this way. And, and I know you're doing that with all of our members together. Help us to continue to seek you. We're not there yet. It's gonna, maybe it's going to take some time. But we want to honor your word. We want to submit to the spirit. And we want you to do just what you want to do here in us. We want to humble ourselves before your word. And if you say, hey... This is what's going on, and this is the problem, and this is where you fit in it. 
Help us to be humble before you to say, agree, Spirit, you were right. Now bring about a change. Yes, I left the window open. Yes, it's cold as all get out, but help me to close the window. Help me to fire up the engine and let the heat begin to actually, again, thaw me out here. And I pray today for anyone here who has never trusted Father, your son, Jesus. Please don't let me overlook someone who came today and, and they're like, whoa, man, I don't know what's going on in this church family, but wow, that's a lot of scripture and a lot of preaching. But there's something real here. And I pray for a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, who just simply would say, I'm lost. I've tried to find my own way in life and I can't do it. I am lost. But you say Jesus is the way. And the map to hope and freedom and forgiveness comes through believing this historical but profound truth that God sent his son Jesus, his one and only son, to be born of the Virgin Mary, to live a sinless life, to speak as God the Son, to do miracles and works of power that confirmed and affirmed and displayed his glory. He allowed himself willingly to be to be judged and to be hung on a cross and nailed there with his hands and feet. He willingly died there, taking upon himself your sin and my sin and the sins of the world. He took the judgment we all deserve and he was buried and he was left there to, to be buried for three days and three days later his tomb opened up and he exited fully alive, resurrected, as only God the Son could do. If you will humble yourself and admit that you're a sinner and that his death on the cross was for you and trust him in his victorious resurrection, you will be saved. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I pray that this is a moment for you, someone, maybe one, maybe two, in which you're just simply saying, I'm done with religion, I'm done with just whatever I've been believing in, I'm, gonna, I'm, just, I'm going all out with Jesus. And you will never be the same. And that's a good thing. Father, I just commit this moment to you, and I pray that in this place, someone, somewhere, whether here or online, is bowing the knee of their heart and just simply saying, and if it happens, oh God, it's because of always of your mercy and your grace. It's no good to us. It's no status. It's, we know kind of where we've been. I know where I've been. I, I'm, there's no status to add to this gospel. It's your gospel itself that would save persons. And I pray that that would take place today.